Hi everyone, and welcome to the first of my series of videos on computer systems. Uh, these are being created for the class CS5541, also titled Computer Systems at Western Michigan University, but I'm putting them out there for anyone who might be interested in checking them out for general interest, or if you happen to be taking a class in which some of this material might be appropriate, feel free to take a look at these and see if there's anything useful. Uh, the slides for this class are based on lecture notes developed by Randall E. Bryant and David R. O. Halloran in conjunction with their textbook, Computer Systems, A Programmer's Perspective. And that's where a lot of the examples and figures are going to be taken from. So I'd like to thank them for their kind permission in allowing me to use their materials in creating my own slides and lectures. Uh, and with that, let's talk about how this series of videos is going to be organized. I've set things up as a series of modules. Uh, module zero, uh, which is basically covered by this video, is just an introduction to the material, some interesting examples about things to look out for when you're programming and dealing with computer systems in general. Uh, we'll be talking about how numbers are represented, we'll talk about machine code a little bit, etc. and so on. Now, many, especially the first modules, are going to be using material from the Computer Systems, a Programmer's Perspective book. Uh, as I use other reference materials, uh, I will indicate those in individual videos as well. So that's not the only textbook we'll be using for these videos, but it's what we're going to start with for the first several modules. Uh, each module will be broken down into however many videos is necessary, really. I'll be referencing which chapters of textbooks things are coming from, and uh, I'll do something in the titles to indicate you know, how many uh, videos there are in a particular module so that you can keep track. And if you want to, you'll be able to follow along from start to finish. So let's dive right in and talk about the introduction to the course. Again, we'll just go over some kind of interesting things. Don't worry too much if you're not really getting a lot of the inner workings of the stuff I'm going to be talking about. That's okay. We're just showing you some interesting things and pointing out some problems. And as we move through the rest of the material, we'll be talking about exactly why these things happen and how we can guard against them and what we need to be aware of when we're programming. Uh, my name is Jason Eric Johnson. I'll be your instructor for these videos. Uh, and these links here are to my website where you can find uh, some hopefully interesting blog posts and a few other things and also just general information about me. And if you need to contact me, this is my uh, email address here, jason.e.johnson at wmich.edu. So let's dive right in. The first thing we'll do in this video is some stuff about getting organized a little bit. Um, I'm going to be showing some things about how to use uh, Western Michigan University's online learning, uh, e-learning platform. Uh, if you're not taking this course at Western, then you can uh, scrub on past that. That won't necessarily affect you too much. But uh, once I get through that for a few minutes, we'll talk about some kind of oh, the overall theme of the course and five realities that we want to keep in mind whenever we're programming, whether we're designing hardware, whether we're programming in whatever language we happen to be programming in. Um, th there are some realities about dealing with computer systems that we always want to keep in mind. And we'll kind of go through those and show again, show some interesting examples of some pitfalls that a lot of new programmers don't necessarily know about. So first things first, if you are taking this class at Western Michigan University, you'll be accessing course materials through our e-learning interface. Now, once you get logged into e-learning, if you scroll down a bit past your news feed, you'll see the My Courses section, and one of your uh, options will be CS5541-950 Computer Systems. So if we click on that, we'll take a look at what we have and how we're going to arrange your materials throughout the course. Uh, the first thing will be your course homepage where you'll have your news feed. That's uh, the important thing. You'll also see the upcoming events over here on the right. Uh, for example, you'll see that you already have an assignment that'll be due on the 10th uh, of January. Uh, if you're 
taking a look at it for spring of 2019. Uh, down below that, you'll see some information about me if you're interested. Um, but everything that's due, quizzes, assignments, etc., will show up over on your upcoming events with availability ends basically means this is your due date. Okay, so the submission drop box or the quiz or a test will be available until your due date. After that, it won't be available anymore. You won't be able to see it anymore. So you want to make sure to pay attention to this calendar over here and uh, be sure to get things in by the due dates because we, we don't want to be late on assignment submissions and we certainly don't want to miss quizzes or tests. Uh, the news feed on the left is where I will put uh, important, uh, important class announcements and things. So keep an eye on that. You can also, on my uh, website from uh, that slide a couple slides ago, you'll be able to see a blog post about how to set up notifications so that you can be alerted by email to important changes in the course. So I'd recommend taking a look at that and setting that up so you just never have to worry about missing anything. Now, the important tab that we're going to care about is up here at the top, we have Course Home on the left, and then we have Content. So if you click on Content, you'll get yourself over to a table of contents. This is where everything will be laid out. Uh, right now, there's just the introduction module there. But over here on the left, you're going to see all of your course modules that I mentioned in that last slide, uh, or the slide before last. Uh, as you move down, the first thing that you're gonna care about is course information. Here's where you'll have the syllabus, the resources page, guidelines for your homeworks, your course schedule. So for example, on your course resources tab, if we click on that, you'll just have some information on free C tutorials that you can go find, an IDE that you could use if you want to use an IDE and not just the text editor for programming, and just several other tools that you might find useful uh, as far as moving through the class and submitting your assignments. So definitely take a look and read through all of the pages in this uh, course information section, first thing, make sure you're familiar with all of that. Then we have our modules. Right now we can take a look at the introduction module. You'll start with an overview and how long you should take on this thing for this one, you know, about the first two or three days, about half a week. Uh, you'll have an idea of what kind of objectives we're looking at as far as what I want you to take away from this module and what kind of activities you'll be doing. Then we have the slide deck for this very presentation. Uh, we'll have this video, we'll go into the video section and any videos moving forward will be your lectures for the, uh, for the class. You'll have reading assignments. Uh, in this case, we have one assignment where you're just gonna write a simple C program to make sure you've got your tool chain set up for doing assignments. You might also see sections for quizzes, for extra recommended reading, etc. The point is, for each module that you're working on, everything you need to complete that module will be in the individual module sections on the contents tab. Now, the, there's some other stuff up here that you can explore. So for example, assessments, if you go to Dropbox, that's where you're going to have the drop boxes where you can submit your uh, assignments. Uh, and if you click on this, you'll see that you've got the assignment itself laid out for you right there. And then down at the bottom here, you have submit assessment where you can, or submit assignment where you can actually go ahead and submit your your work so that you can get graded on that. So there's obviously a ton more here. So take some time and get familiar with the e-learning course shell. Uh, and once you've done that, go ahead and continue on with the rest of this video and we'll uh, get back into it now. So something that we wanna keep in mind throughout the course of our taking this class or watching these videos is that abstraction is good, Right, we, we're CS people, we love our abstraction, right? But we don't wanna forget the reality of things. We don't want to forget how things are actually working when we get down into the guts and we look at how numbers are actually represented and what's actually going on on a CPU when we write a program and run a program. Um, again, most CS courses emphasize that abstraction, right? We, we have abstract data types, we use asymptotic analysis. 
which you know we're we're dropping constant factors. We're we're kind of getting rid of a lot of stuff because we're we're abstracting things and looking at the overall picture. But these abstractions have some limits, uh, particularly in the presence of bugs. If we've got bugs in our code, the abstractions get broken, right? And we need to understand what's going on under the hood. So we have to understand the details of those underlying implementations. Uh, now, some useful outcomes, like what, what are you going to be able to hopefully do better after you take this course? You're going to become a more effective programmer. We want to be help you learn the tools to find and eliminate bugs in an efficient way. We want you to be able to understand and tune for program performance. Right? There are differences. Actually, we'll see some examples where if you just have nested loops and you kind of flip around the order in which you're doing things, you can have impressive increases in performance by just doing things in the right order. Uh, so we have to understand what's going on under the hood in order to be able to take advantage of that. Uh, the other thing that you're going to get out of this course is to prepare for later systems and concepts in CS. Uh, when we start talking about compilers, operating systems, networks, storage systems, etc., etc., an understanding of the basic operating systems and architecture knowledge that you get from this series of videos is going to help you out with those fields of study as well. So I mentioned that we have five realities that we want to kind of keep in the back of our minds as we go through this material. So here's the first one. Ints are not equal to integers and floats are not equal to reals. Uh, what am I talking about when I say this? Well, when we say int, in a lot of cases, we're going to be talking about when we declare a variable to be of the type int in, in say, a C program. Uh, when we want to uh, represent a real number, we're going to use uh, like a floating point. Uh, so we would declare something as a float. They don't necessarily work the same way as those underlying mathematical concepts do. So a great example is x squared greater than or equal to zero. Um, for floats, actually, the answer is yes. But for ints, it can be a little more complicated. Now, for integers, you know, just mathematically speaking, well, of course, um, zero times zero is going to be zero. So that takes care of the is x squared equal to zero in that case, sure. And in any other pair of integers, we've got, you know, negative times a negative is going to end up being a positive, and a positive times a positive, of course, is going to be a positive. So, well, of course, we look at that and we intuitively think, well, sure. But if we take a look, we say, okay, look, 40,000 times 40,000 is going to be 1.6 billion. Pretty straightforward. But what is 50,000 times 50,000? It should be 2.5 billion. But is it when we actually get into writing a program? Another example is associativity. Uh, you know, we think back to basic algebra. We say, oh, look, you know, x, the quantity x plus y plus z should be equal to x plus the quantity y plus z. Associativity should be fine. And when we're programming for signed and unsigned ints, yep, we're good to go. That should work just fine. With floats, it, again, it could be more complicated. The quantity, 1 times 10 to the 20th, plus negative 1 times 10 to the 20th, plus 3.14 is going to evaluate to 3.14. But what happens if we change the parentheses around? Well, let's go ahead and try this out and see. I'm a big fan. I mean, we're computer scientists here, so I'm a big fan of if we think that something... Uh, you know, might be interesting, might behave in a weird way. Let's go ahead and do a little experiment, right? Let's code this thing out and take a look and see exactly what it actually does when we code it and run it. So I've gone ahead and coded those examples just so we can, go ahead, let's compile them, run them, and see what happens. Uh, now what I've got on this screen is just my text editor where I've, uh, written a few demos for you here. So we'll go through the code here first. As you can see, it's very simple. I mean, we're not going crazy on this. We just want to do a little toy program to demonstrate this concept. And actually, I'll give you a little uh, spoiler here. This is something called overflow. So when we talk about is 50,000 times 50,000 what we expect it to be, what we're going to run into here is something called overflow. Uh, so all we're doing is multiplying those uh, 
numbers together and we're going to just sort of output what these what this thing comes up with right what does it do what we expect it to do so over here in my terminal uh, i've gotten my uh, gcc line all set up here we're going to call the executable overflow uh, and we're going to notice that I put this little dash W flag in. Now that is something that we're not going to want to do when we're doing our programming assignments because what that does is suppresses warnings because GCC is actually going to give us a warning about trying to do what we're about to do. But for the sake of the demonstration, let's not skip ahead. Let's let's sort of suppress that. We'll take a look and we'll see what this thing actually does. Then we'll go ahead and run it without that flag. We're actually going to want to have it show all warnings when we're working on our assignments, because when we get warnings, we really want to go back and refactor our code and get rid of them. Uh, but this is a great example because we'll see what happens here. I've gone ahead and compiled it and that went through fine. This thing actually compiled and it's ready to run. So when I run overflow, We'll see that, okay, 40,000 times 40,000. Oh, that's exactly what we expect it to be, 1.6 billion. But 50,000 times 50,000 ends up being this negative 1794, et cetera, this weird negative number. So what the heck is going on with that, right? That seems weird, doesn't it? Well, as we have something called overflow, where we've actually tried to put a number that's too big for the underlying representation. And we're going to get into this, we're going to deep dive into this um, in module one when we talk about number representations, but this is a great example of something weird that can happen. And again, notice that this thing compiled fine. This was not an error as far as the compiler's concerned. And if we actually take away that flag that suppresses warnings, we'll see, oh, look, we have a warning. It says overflow in the expression, right? So it's smart enough to, to GCC. The compiler is smart enough to tell us, oh, hey, there's a weirdness here, right? This is going to overflow and it's going to end up doing something odd. Uh, so that's important. We want to pay attention to these warnings because we don't want to end up with a program that compiles and runs, but ends up giving us weird uh, output that we don't expect, right? This thing's not going to actually work properly uh, when we run it. We're going to expect 50,000 times 50,000 to be 2.5 billion, but that's not what's going to happen. And so this is just one of the examples of why we have to understand what's going on under the hood. Again, module one. Uh, we're going to get into exactly exactly what's going on with this warning, why we get this weird negative number when we multiply these two positive numbers. Uh, but for right now, just be aware this is the kind of weird thing that we're talking about. Now, that second example from the last slide uh, is associativity. All right, so we've got an associativity demo here as well, where once again, I've just gone ahead and coded out exactly what was there in the slide, All right? We're just gonna evaluate these expressions and let's see what actually happens. So over here, I've got that ready to compile. Now, notice that one doesn't even give a warning. We don't have that suppression flag set. Uh, this thing just compiles fine. Uh, and so if we run our associativity executable, we see that, oh, the first one evaluates to 3.14. The second one evaluates to zero. Huh. Well, that's weird. Again, as, as far as we're aware, as far as associativity goes, in addition, uh, we should be able to switch those parentheses around all we want, and it should evaluate to the same thing, mathematically speaking. But when we get into code, that's not what happens. This is another one. We will deep dive into this when we talk about floating points. Uh, in the next module, but be aware, it's another thing that just does something weird that mathematically you wouldn't expect. Uh, but when we're programming, we have to understand underlying representations in order to figure out why it does these kind of what seem like weird things. And that's something that we're going to be getting into in this course. Now, it's important to understand that computer arithmetic, despite what we just saw, it's not generating random values, okay? They're 
do have important mathematical properties, but when we're programming, we can't assume all the usual mathematical properties. Uh, we have a finiteness of our representations. We only have so many bits to work with. Uh, now, integer operations satisfy what are called ring properties. So integer operations do satisfy commutativity, associativity, distributivity. Floating point operations satisfy ordering properties. So monotonicity, values of signs, floating points, we can rely on those properties. With integers, we can rely on the ring properties. But again, because we only have so much space, we only have so many basically digits to represent each kind of thing, it's not necessarily going to work the same as when we're just doing math with a paper and pencil. Um, so here's an observation that we want to keep in mind. We have to understand which abstractions apply in which contexts. Now, these are important issues for compiler writers and for serious application programmers. This stuff matters because we want to make sure that we know what our uh, programs are going to do. We don't want our programs surprising us, right? We, we want these things to act in a consistent way. So we have to understand the limitations on the representations that we're using. So reality number two, you've got to know assembly. Uh, I know it looks all weird and freaky and it's not nice and high level like C or Java or Python, right? It, it looks like, well, it looks like code. Um, and the chances are you're never going to write programs in assembly. You're never going to like just pop open a text editor and start banging away assembly. But you know, compilers are, are better at it. They're more patient than we are, right? Um, as understanding assembly is key to the machine level execution model. We have to know assembly so we can understand the behavior of programs in the presence of bugs, right? If we dive into assembly, we can get an idea of what a program is going to do in the presence of bugs when the higher level language models tend to break down a bit. They're, they're not as good at informing us of what's going on, again, under the hood. Uh, we can use an understanding of assembly to tune program performance. Um, when the compiler does its thing to implement system software, machine code's the target. Uh, operating systems have to manage the process state. Uh, and when malware is being created or when we're fighting against malware, x86 assembly is the language of choice that we're going to get into that in this series because we have to we've got to understand it if we really want to be working at a professional level reality number three memory matters we've got to understand the different types of memory we got to understand how they work okay we have to understand the limitations memory's not unbounded Right? I mean, you know, we don't go buy a computer and say, oh, I would like an infinite amount of memory, please. Um, it's got to be allocated and managed because we only have so much to uh, work with. Uh, and a lot of applications are memory dominated. Uh, memory referencing bugs are uh, very, very difficult to track down. The effects are distance. They're distance in time. They're distance in space. It can be tough to track these things down. And we're, we're going to go ahead and take a look at an example uh, of a memory referencing bug in the next couple slides. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is the performance isn't uniform. We have different levels of cache. We have different ways of dealing with virtual memory. Um, and these can all affect our, our performance. So adapting a program to the characteristics of the memory can lead to a lot of great speed improvements. Uh, but we have to understand what kinds of memory allocation uh, options there are out there. We have to understand the different types of memory and their characteristics if we're going to go ahead and take advantage of that. So let's take a look at a, a quick little toy example of how memory can affect things and what kind of mistakes we might make that can cause some memory referencing issues. On uh, this little snippet of code, we just have a struct that we've defined. We've got an integer array, right? Notice that the size of that is just two. We should have index zero and index one, and after that, things get weird. Um, we have a double, and, and that's all we've got. So if we uh, have our little function here where we're just gonna pass an integer into it, 
and we're going to uh, declare an instance of our struct. We're going to set the double equal to 3.14, and then we're going to just pop something into the index of the array that we specify with the integer that we passed in, and then just return the double. Uh, now, it doesn't seem really at first blush like that second uh, or third line in the function should probably really do all that much, right? I mean, we're declaring the double or we're setting the double equal to 3.14 and then we're returning that double. But notice that as we put in different integers that we pass in, we can get different results. And ooh, boy, that seems kind of weird. Uh, we need to understand what's going on in order to figure out why we're getting these odd results. Thing is, I don't really like to just sort of trust slides I see when I'm taking a course. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and show you writing and running this code uh, because I encourage you to do that with all the examples that you see throughout this course and any other really. Um, you know, if you if you are being shown something weird, go take a look, do it yourself. You know, make sure that this is that these things apply on your own systems as well. Uh, so here I've gone ahead and just written up that code. Uh, we've got our struct here. We've got our function down. Oops, our function down here, right? So we just put it exactly as you saw it on the last slide, and then in the main we're just going to call our function with zero through six to see what happens. So back over here in the terminal, uh, we'll go ahead and compile that. And then when we run our ref, uh, this is for our referencing bug demo uh, executable, we'll see that, oh, yep, we've got uh, fun zero is uh, 3.14, function with one passed in is 3.14. Oh, then function with two is a little weird, but it's not exactly the same. And that, again, that seems odd. We, we declared the double to be 3.14. We haven't actually done anything to the double, but here, here it is doing weird stuff, right? Uh, function three is 2.0. We're not even in close to 3.14 anymore. Uh, and then as we move forward, we get back to the point where our double is back to 3.14. But then eventually we end up with this segmentation fault down here. So we, we've actually broken the program. It compiled just fine. It didn't even give us any warnings. But we, we, we did something in there that just made this whole thing blow up. So let's take a look at an explanation and get just sort of a general idea of what's going on here and why it's doing weird stuff like that. So what in the world is going on? Um, the top of this slide is just kind of a reminder of what we just saw. And the important thing is when we declare this struct, okay, that's going to get, if you to look down in the explanation section, that gets laid out in memory. Okay, and so since structs get laid out in memory uh, in the order in which we declare things within them, and we'll get into that as we move through our uh, memory modules a little later on, uh, we'll see that our integer array A starts at uh, a relative location 0 and 1, right? Then our double, the first four bytes of the double is in location 2. The second four bytes of the double is in location 3. And that's the end of our struct. But then as we start getting into uh, location 4, location 5, location 6, we're, we're not sure what's going on. We've actually gone beyond the limits of our struct. Uh, and that's where we can start running into trouble. And that's why it's doing weird things. When I do something, when I assign a value to that integer array, but I do it outside of the bounds of what I'd already declared of the of space that I actually gave it, I start, I start overwriting parts of the double, right? And so that's where we get those weird, the 3.13 and the 2.0, etc. Um, and then when we start getting into index four, index five, index six, well, okay, sure, we've we've gone past. Once we're at four, we're not overwriting the double anymore, so that's where the 3.14s can come back like we expect them to. But eventually, you know, we're in uncharted territory here. We're in a memory that we have not allocated. So we're we're messing things up. Even there where the program is doing what we expect it to do. I expect this program to return 3.14. Um, but 
I'm messing with other portions of memory. So I could be breaking other stuff. And that's why these memory bugs can be so weird. They can be so hard to track down and fix because I'm not necessarily going to do something. When I reference for there, I might be breaking something else. Some other program might be trying to use that piece of memory uh, that I've just gone and messed with. Um, and so I'm not necessarily going to see the outcome of that right away when I run my program. So it's actually great when we get that segmentation fault, because at least we now know it's like, oh, hey, wait, we, we must have messed something up here somewhere. Uh, but the, uh, you know, that fun, when we call the function with four and we call it with five, we're just out there modifying memory that our program isn't really supposed to be modifying. It could be ending up changing things for other processes. So um, that's a very simplified explanation. Again, this is another thing we're going to deep dive into in future videos and in future modules. But it's just another example, something that you got to be very, very careful about. And another reason that you really want to learn this material. So you, you kind of know about these pitfalls and how to avoid them. So Part of the problem here is that C and C++ don't provide any memory protection. Uh, so out of bounds array references like we just saw, invalid pointer values, abuses of malloc and free when we're doing memory management, these can all lead to nasty bugs because the languages themselves, the compiler doesn't necessarily tell you that you've messed this up. Notice in our, our referencing thing we we were doing out of bounds array references but it compiled and ran just fine right it didn't tell us that this was a problem it's up to us as programmers to figure that out um so again as we just saw whether the bug has an effect depends on the system depends on the compiler uh, right, because when we were referencing that array out of bounds, there were a few different indices that we could put in there that didn't cause a segmentation fault and didn't cause any output that would make us worry. Right. So we we're responsible for figuring that out ourselves. Uh, and the, the bugs can have something. It can be action at a distance. You can have a corrupted object that's logically unrelated to the one being accessed, right? If I'm just messing around in parts of memory that I'm not supposed to be messing around in, I don't know what I'm actually messing up. Uh, so the effect of a bug might be observed long after it's generated, right? I might make that out of bounds uh, array reference and not see an actual bug present itself to me for a long time after that's actually happened. So that makes it tough to figure out. You know, I, I, it's harder to track something down when what you did two days ago it messed up what's happening now. Right? We tend to think in terms of, oh, I'm seeing an error. It must be something I just did. That's not necessarily the case. So how do we deal with this? Uh, well, we can program in languages that do have some memory protection, like Java, Ruby, or Python, etc. Uh, but what we're going to focus on in this class is understanding what interactions could occur. Uh, and we'll also talk about some development tools that can detect referencing errors like Valgrind. We'll see some assignments that uh, have to do with that. Reality number four. It's not just about asymptotic complexity. I know we tend to focus on that all the time, right? In, in so many classes, and, and I do this myself in other classes, we, we don't worry too much about anything beyond that asymptotic complexity because we're talking about these abstractions. But in reality, constant factors matter too. We drop constant factors when we're doing asymptotic analysis, but you know, a constant factor if our input size is a couple thousand, a constant factor of a hundred versus a million, it's going to matter, right? And even an exact op count doesn't predict performance. Uh, you can see a 10 to one performance range depending on how you write your code. There's a ton of different levels that you have to optimize at. We've got to optimize our algorithm, our data representations, procedures, loops, etc. And we have to understand what's going on under the hood. We have to understand the system in order to optimize performance. We're going to learn in the this progression how programs are compiled and executed, how we measure program performance, how we identify bottlenecks, uh, and how to improve the performance without destroying our modularity and generality, 
Right? These are all important topics that we're just going to need to understand if we really want to code at a professional level. So this shows us uh, some experimental results of a very simple test where we just have a couple multi-dimensional arrays. We're just stepping through and copying them over, right? Uh, we're copying our source to our destination. Uh, we're referencing them with an I and a J. Uh, and so you've probably seen this. You've probably done this, right? This is a very, very simple idea. Um, but the difference between the, these two programs is that in the first one, we have I as our outer loop, right? And with the second one, we have J as our outer loop. Now, these are going to work the same, right? Our output is going to be exactly the same. Both of these approaches work just fine. But notice that the first one, when we do I as the outer loop, J as the inner loop, is going to run on a 2.0 gigahertz uh, core i7 Haswell processor in 4.3 milliseconds. Whereas when we swap those around put and just change the order of the loops, right, the order of which loop is on the outside and which is on the inside, if we've got J as the outer loop and I as the inner loop, it blows up to 81.8 milliseconds. All right, so that's a huge performance hit just by swapping those two lines. And both of these programs do exactly the same thing. So this depends on our memory organization. It depends on access patterns, right? So it depends on how the processor acts, steps through multidimensional arrays. And this is another thing. Well, when we talk about memory, we'll get into the different options about how memory can be organized and allocated that are going to lead to this kind of behavior. But as you can see, we kind of want to know what our system is going to be doing. We don't necessarily want um, our code to be written in exactly the same way based on what architecture we're dealing with and how those these memory issues are dealt with. And reality five, uh, it would be nice if all we had to do was write a program and make sure it ran properly, make sure we didn't have any you know weird problems with our algorithm and that would be all we'd have to do. But we gotta do more than that, right? We have to get data in and out. Um, we've got input output systems and that's critical to reliability and performance. Um, we have to communicate over networks, right? I mean, what, what do you use these days that's not network enabled in some way? Um, and a lot of system level issues arise in the presence of a network. Uh, so concurrent operations by auto autonomous processes, uh, coping with unreliable media, cross-platform compatibility. These are complex performance issues that are added in because we're communicating, we're getting data in and out of the system in a lot of different ways all the time. So we have to understand that too. We have to make sure that we know what kind of effects the whole system and what kind of effects these things, this getting data in and out, the network communication, we have to understand what that does to a system as a whole because it's going to affect the applications we write. Now, well, that should give you an idea of what kind of things we're gonna be looking at in this course. Uh, some stuff to keep in mind if you're taking CS5541 at Western, uh, use e-learning for your course management. So go ahead and get into the e-learning shell. Make sure you're familiar with all that. Read through all of the course information. Um, set up your course news and whatever else you'd like. Uh, get, get your notifications going. Uh, this is a link to that blog post I mentioned earlier in the video where you can... Uh, It'll show you how to set up your notifications in e-learning so that uh, whenever I put out a new news item or, or anything else you want, really, you can get an email or text notification so you know exactly what's going on. Make sure you're staying on target with the course. Uh, be sure to contact me with any questions you might have, and sooner is better. Get in touch with me before due dates have passed. Um, if I hear from you an hour before an assignment is due saying, oh, hey, I need more time, yeah, that's going to get you less uh, mercy than um, if you you know, get in touch with me a day or two before something's due and ask some questions. Let me know what's going on. I'm going to be a lot more open to giving you some extra time. I'm always here to help no matter what or when as far as understanding the material. But as far as uh, having a little flexibility with due dates and things, get in touch with me 
well before the due date arrives so I know what's going on and what you're dealing with so that we can uh, make some reasonable adjustments as far as if you're having trouble with an assignment. It's okay. I'm open to that. But make sure you get in touch with me sooner rather than later. So that's it for our course introduction. And uh, our next video, we'll start getting into module one where we're going to talk about number representations.